Okay, I think we're ready to start. Um, so welcome everyone to the Board Legislative Committee of the East Bay Regional Park District on, well, it is uh, Friday, June 22nd, and we are beginning at 1238. So if I could have the recording secretary, please call the roll. Absolutely. So this is Yuli Padmore, recording secretary, taking role, and uh, Chair Eccles. Present. Director Rosario. Here. Director Waspy. Here. And Park District staff par participating in this meeting include uh, Eric Feeler. Present. Chief of Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> uh, Lisa Baldinger. Um, great. Thank you. Flora Chantosh. Wonderful. Here, present. And we have Katie Hornbeck. Present. Brian Holt. I'm supposed to say present, present. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> that's great. Okay, and then we have both of our uh, state uh, advocates, Doug Houston, who is present, and we have Peter Umhofer, who is our federal advocate, who is also present. Okay, thank you. Um, and if you could also please let people know um, how the public can submit comments. Yes, so today's meeting is held pursuant to the Brown Act as amended by AB 361. Board members and staff may participate via phone video conferencing. We are providing live audio and video streaming. And for those members of the public not attending in person, public comments may be submitted live via Zoom. Via email uh, to ypadmore at ebparks.org or voicemail by calling 510-544-2002 as noted on the agenda. If there are no questions about the meeting procedures, we will begin. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I think first up we have, um, hold on a second. So I, I think it's our, our government affairs doing an update first on the agenda. Yeah. Or, we can start. Um, just uh, briefly, uh, we had a conversation with Dee a little bit ago about our Sacramento Advocacy Day. Um, and um, thank you, Doug, for you and your team setting up uh, a, nice, a nice set of meetings. Um, we're going to start over with the resources building. And um, I'm not sure we're going to go through the PowerPoint, but, but um, we're going to be at the resources building. Uh, in the morning meeting with a couple deputy secretaries, one for, I believe she's mostly responsible for wildfire and vegetation management, Jessica Morris. Uh, Dennis, I think you might've met her when um, she was out, out on site uh, last October. Uh, and then we are meeting with the de deputy director of the legislation and then uh, moving over to the water wildlife conservation board and meeting with their executive director. And then we have a series of meetings with our um, delegation, mostly staff. Um, I think we do have a meeting with Lori Wilson and also with Mia Bonta. So those will be great meetings to have Dee there and, and, and have uh, make some introductions, and especially with Lori, who's, who's not, may not be familiar with the Park District. Uh, so that's our Sacramento Advocacy Day, our main focus. Well. Depending upon if we find out whether we got our member asked between now and then, um, or did not get them, either way, um, our main focus of conversation is going to be uh, ecologically sensitive vegetation management and uh, the $8 million funding request that Mia Bonta um, put forward on behalf of the East Bay delegation as part of the, the budget package. Um, so that's, that's in a nutshell, uh, the plan. And I know we don't have a lot of time for this meeting today. So I think unless there's questions, I think I would then pass it over to Lisa just to let us let folks know where they can find information about the spring spring survey since we went through that yesterday at the uh, study session. Any questions on Sacramento or Doug? 
All right, and then just since it is agendized, we wanted to let folks uh, via YouTube as well as in this Zoom room know where the Spring Scientific Survey top lines can be found. Uh, yesterday, the East Bay Regional Park District Board of Directors held a study session, and so if you go to our website, go to the public meetings page um, under study session for June 23rd, uh, we are the second item on the agenda, so we are in the first uh, half of the meeting, and we go over the top lines there. Um, and we are currently working with our consultants on securing the cross tabs, and we hope to bring back a, a deeper, more formal presentation uh, to this committee in the future, looking at the cross tab data. Great. Thank, Thank you, Lisa. You. And yeah. then I'm, oh, go ahead. I'm just going to try to share screen real quick to um, pull up the memo for um, the election results. Uh, this was a, a product uh, of Flora worked on. Um, I don't think it's gone out in hard copy yet, but the general manager has approved. Um, just want to note that um, the results aren't going to be certified until July 15th. So we, we, there's still some votes being counted. But what's notable here is the turnout, how very, very low it was. Um, 18% in Contra Costa County, 11% well, in Alameda. Contra Costa had a, um, a uh, contested supervisoral race. So I imagine that's perhaps what drove. Oh, and they also had a, a race for um, controller, I think. Um, might have been, might've been what, what drove turnout in that county. Uh, that supervisorial race included Carlin Obringer, who's the chair of our PAC. Uh, she's currently in third, and I think she told me yesterday or the day before that there's still about 10,000 votes to be counted there. I'm not sure if it'll be enough for her to make up the, the difference, but um, we're going to continue to monitor that one. And in um, the supervisorial race, although I guess that should have driven turnout in, in Alameda County, but uh, Rebecca Kaplan is leading and um, Lena Tam finished second. I don't think there's any, any doubt that those will be the top two. And then just notable in the zone seven election, Olivia San Wong is also a PAC member and an incumbent on their board and she retains, uh, retains her seat. And then notably, and, and I believe Director Coffey discussed this yesterday, the parcel tax in Martinez that passed so that some wildlife habitat could be purchased um, was, uh, as he noted, was not passing on election night, but is now passing with enough of a margin that I don't think any additional votes will, will change it. So that's a big win for Martinez and for open space. And then also in Marin County, Measure A uh, to protect open space uh, was, was uh, passed as well. Uh, not quite as high as our 85% would measure FF, but fairly sizable margin. So that's a good, that's a good sign. And then we, uh, our incumbent set state Senator, Bob Wykowski is being termed out. So the mayor of Fremont, Lily May, who's been a friend of the park district will be likely facing uh, Aisha. Um, I don't think that there's gonna be enough votes for, for Paul Pimentel. Mental. I'm not sure how to say that. Uh, we'll, uh, so it'll probably be Aisha and Lily May, which I think was somewhat expected. Uh, Lori Wilson, our new uh, assembly member for District 11 is, is confirmed. And then the rest of those were pretty much, except for um, District 20, uh, Bill Quirk is, is um, leaving office. And um, in the race to, to fill that seat, Sean Kamega, Kamege uh, is, um, the, I'm not sure what his title is. I think he's senior field rep for assembly member about, about Rebecca bauer Cahan, but also a friend of the park district and also a Dublin city council member. Um, so he may be in finishing the top two uh, against Liz Ortega. And then interestingly in district 24, Alex Lee was uh, being challenged by his predecessor, Kansen Chu and um, it doesn't look like he'll be um, facing Camps and Chu in the, uh, in the runoff. So uh, interesting turnaround there. And Alex Lee is a friend of the Park District and has been to our district, I think, more than Camps and Chu had been. So um, that's a, essentially a positive for the district. And then I don't think there was anything in the statewide races um, 
Rob Bonta was pretty handily um, ahead. And then in our federal races, uh, there was one, yeah, uh, District 8, John Garamendi, that's a new district for the park, for, for the East Bay. Uh, he did represent part of the East Bay back in um, around 2012, 14, somewhere in there uh, for a few years and when Ellen Tauscher was appointed to um, the State Department. So we'll have him back as a member of our delegation. Jerry McNerney decided not to run. Um, so Josh Harder moved up north from his existing congressional district to run in District 9 and is, um, is, in, is ahead there. Um, we we'll be running in the fall. And I don't think there was anything else contested. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer or uh, any questions of our, oh, I should stop sharing screen. I can figure out how to do that. If I could mention one thing, Eric, there's been kind of a, a new development on the insurance commissioner front. I don't know if folks are aware of it, but our incumbent was being challenged by Marin um, County Assembly member of Mark Levine. All oh, right. And, and he he's actually pulled into second place. So there might be a dem on dem insurance commissioner race leading mm -hmm. into November, um, which will be very interesting. Yeah, thanks for saying that, Doug. I, that should be on the memo. We'll, we'll add it. Um, and he did, uh, he did as a member of Parks and Wildlife Committee, did, to, did a site visit at um, Miller Knox to see our, our vegetation issues. And um, our fire chief, Eileen Tiley, uh, did talk to him about insurance and how much of a challenge that is given uh, permanent wildfire season. So um, definitely something on his mind. So. It's a little known secret. He was extremely helpful way back in the day when we were working on a bill that Mr. Frazier had introduced that we opposed. He pretty much single-handedly suppressed that piece of legislation. Um, so he's been, he's been very, very helpful and a friend to the district. Was that... Um... And we can move on, but was that the AB 665 or was that the, the $10 Absolutely. million dollar budget shift? No, nope. nope. it was 665. Okay, got it. Uh, Dennis had a question. Yeah, Eric, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, it's, I think things have really, really changed a whole bunch. And I noticed that those findings or, or the election results were from June 7th. Uh, I just looked at the Alameda County website and, you know, it, it, it's still dismal, but 32% of the Alameda County voters voted. It's everybody votes at the last minute or puts it in the mail on the last day. So mail-in ballots really jumped it up. Not that 32% is anything, but Lily May, who was way far ahead in, at, on June 7th, is now neck and neck with Aisha and some of these other um, races have changed quite a bit. Uh, and and, and uh, the sheriff of Alameda County was soundly defeated after the the um, mail-ins brought were brought in. It was neck and or it was close, and then he he uh, sheriff Andrews got blown away, and and so did uh, a few other people. Well, well, yeah, and that sheriff race is an interesting one because I I heard there was a, a problem with the winner that she um, I think is now being charged with election fraud. So we'll see what happens. Oh, no. Well, well, yeah, she, um, I, from what I understand, you have to have five years experience in, in, um, I guess, as, well, I, I don't know exactly, it, there was certain experience that, that apparently she didn't have, and maybe, she, well, anyway, I don't want to get into it all here, but, but there's a whole other issue there. She had won by 51%, but, but not clear what's going to happen now at this point. Wow. Yeah. yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Dennis. We will update the numbers before we send it out. Here, Eccles, it appears uh, we have a public comment from Kelly Abreu. Okay, well, now would be the time. Kelly, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> yeah, um, if there's any talk of uh, crimes, of fraud, of anything like that, you'll, you'll find that the uh, district attorney is a uh, very selective enforcement. For example, on the BART board, they were very very strict about that. And some other appointees uh, are, are not so strict. Um, so it really depends on which, uh, who's, uh, who, who, uh, 
who are your friends in uh, in the, in in high places uh, as to whether or not these uh, laws, these election requirements, these uh, uh, will be strictly strictly prosecuted. Um, over there in Pleasanton, uh, just a month ago, there was uh, two two uh, two actions in mid May by the Pleasanton City Council, uh, which were diametrically opposed. On the one hand, you had people standing up local residents saying they wanted their regional Arroyo trails to be fixed, uh, be, which because they're collapsing and full of potholes and they can't ride their bikes without breaking their faces. Uh, and uh, then other people who live up in the fire area directly underneath the fire that was happening yesterday afternoon uh, were very angry. They didn't want a free, literally free, park trail built for them by a developer because it would bring in more uh, visitors and more more uh, uh, taxpayers of the regional park district. They didn't want any of those people to show up. So uh, they, they, oppose, they got the city council unanimously opposed building a free trail. Uh, I think it was within within the Ple city of Pleasanton paid for by the developer. Um, and likewise, uh, the people, you know, um, I think we need to distinguish between the friends of the district and the friends of the taxpayers and the friends of the parks and the trails. For example, the Fremont politicians, whom I know very well, are uni were uniformly were demanding demanding uh, the closure of a, of, a, of the uh, one of the most important parks in Fremont, Mission Peak, uh, just a while back. And then when they found out that that was maybe not such a good idea, a year and a half later, they were all pretending like they that was done by for uh, health reasons. And that they hadn't really closed the park. Um, so yeah, there is a, di a, a distinction that needs to be made between a friend of the district, and a friend of nature, a friend of park visitors, and a friend of the taxpayers who are looking to have uh, parks and open space. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, Kelly, thank you, thank you for that. And and that that just reminds me that I think it's worth noting that even though Eric has pointed out people that we've worked in the past, that doesn't mean that other people who are also sort of in the top two and are facing election won't also be good good uh, representatives to work with. I, you know, I, I, I think well, Dee and I both know Liz Ortega quite well, and I think she would also, she also is very strong on, on parks and open space. And I know it's meant a lot to her in her lifetime having access to the outdoors. So, so just want to want to be clear that we, we have people that we've worked with and, and we know, but there's also others who who may be good partners for us as well. So, um, okay. So moving right along now to, um, uh, to the next to the local issues, uh, Brian Holt and Neoma Laval. Brian's here. Okay. Hi. Yeah, hi there. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Eccles and members of the committee. Brian Holt, um, Chief of Planning Trails GIS. Um, I will um, end today for Naomi Laval. So let me go ahead and uh, pop this open here. And um, we've got four items that we're going to discuss today. Um, they're going to present on today. I'll go through these fairly quick, um, and then you can let me know if you have any questions. Um, you able to see this uh, local jurisdiction report? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first one item, uh, Concord City Council, May 23rd, um, granted an extension to the exclusive negotiating agreement with um, Concord First Partners, which is a, a partnership made up of um, uh, uh, the uh, Discovery Builders, uh, Sino Family uh, Development, um, Lewis Homes, and um, uh, California Capital Group, which is uh, headed up by Phil Tagami. Uh, so uh, they had basically come to the city and, and requested some requested some agreements from the city uh, regarding um, getting some some land rights that the city did not agree to, but they did agree to extend the agreement through January 2023. So. So they continue to negotiate on that, and um, we continue to advocate for certain uh, things to benefit the regional park, the Thurgood Marshall Regional Park, um, within the term sheet. Um, so that was the first item. Uh, this is a real complicated graph in here that kind of shows where it's at, but um, essentially they need to they need to come to terms on a term sheet so they can begin developing a specific plan and then start negotiating with the Navy um, over the um, over the actual conveyance of the property there. So, um, and I think we have announced to the board, but uh, but just reiterate again, um, the park district 
a couple weeks ago did receive the final public benefit conveyance from the National Park Service. So that's a fee title conveyance that um, is, is complete to us. So we were successful in uh, securing the phase one uh, transfer of 2,200 or so acres of land on the other side of the former Concord Naval Weapons Station. So, so that's great. Our, our property is separate from theirs and we're able to continue to move forward. Um, the second item was um, an item uh, Director Coffey and I participated in uh, the Contra Costa County. Um, uh, Contra Costa County had received an application for a utility scale solar project and it's that little red dot in the bottom right hand corner here completely surrounded by um, East Bay Regional Park District preserve lands within the HCP. Um, county staff had actually asked the um, uh, planning commission to just deny the project outright because the project is located within the HCP area and uh, is located outside of an area that was zoned uh, as suitable for solar. So this light hatched area here around Byron and up in Jersey Island, uh, the county's board of supervisors just last year had, had adopted those areas as suitable for solar. Um, but this project moved forward uh, on its own. County staff wanted to deny it, um, but planning commission uh, supported it moving forward. So the park district uh, actually intervened uh, with Save Mount Diablo to appeal that project uh, and the Board of Supervisors uh, voted unanimously to support our appeal um, and to deny that project. So um, that was that was satisfying. Um, and then the park district was uh, successful in uh, getting included on the community list uh, for fire risk reduction communities. Um, through the California Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. This just gives us some extra points and makes us uh, extra eligible for grant funding for fuel reduction projects within our jurisdiction. Uh, and then lastly, um, uh, at the last uh, California State Historic Resources Commission meeting, there was a proposal to um, to nominate, uh, to designate uh, the area around McKay Avenue, um, including our um, uh, acquired GSA property, as well as Glory of the Seas building, um, the recently named uh, Doug Seiden Visitor Center at Crab Cove and some of the surrounding areas. Um, and then also land that's uh, proposed to become the Alameda Wellness Center um, within the city of Alameda. Uh, it, was it was proposed to designate this area as a, as a historic district. Um, this was sort of done, uh, nominated by an individual um, and was not nominated with the support of our agency or any of the landowners within the district. Um, but it went forward to the Historic Resources Commission anyway, despite the opposition from the city of Alameda um, and the East Bay Regional Park District. Um, the State Historic Preservation Office staff did um, pull the item at, as a result of a last minute request from Senator Nancy Skinner. Um, but they are going to bring back the nomination uh, in August, on August 5th. So, um, so we're, we're preparing to submit comments on that um, and have some concerns really about um, what the um, intent around the historic nomination is. It seems the intent is um, more to stop the development of the Alameda Wellness Center um, ra rather than um, a, a concern for the actual uh, historic nature of the site. So, um, so with that, uh, I can answer any questions on any of these items or other items related to what's going on in the local communities here. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Brian. Excellent report. Um, Director Waspy or Director Rosario, do you have any questions? No, other than that, I'm just perplexed that uh, the city of Concord, I mean, so, Brenda, it, we just can't do it. We're, we're not going to bring infrastructure all the way from where it is now until they, they get something together, right? So we're just waiting on them. Well, we are looking at uh, moving forward with a phase one public access plan in the area located south of Bailey Road, where the board field trip was. 
Um, and we should be able to do that using, um, you know, CXTs and, and, uh, and we do have separate water in that area. We wouldn't have power, um, but, you know, our utility needs are, are lighter than, um, than, you know, the cities are. So for that area, I think we'll, we'll be able to move forward with phase one public access. Um, for the other area, for the visitor center and some of the more developed facilities that are proposed, correct. We really need to be able to tap into the city's infrastructure to, um, to activate that site. All right, thank you. So, so Brian, um, on the, um, the wildfire risk communities, um, how much money is it in that? Uh, you know, I don't have that background. I would have to go back and um, and pull up some of the um, some of the research there. So I can do that and get that for you. But I, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, I, mean, I was thinking that. I mean, uh, it's great to have access to uh, be able to compete for more grants, especially with uh, uh, what's happening with the requests from um, San Ramon and um, Moraga Fire Districts. So. Uh, anything would be helpful. So thank you for bringing this up to our attention. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Brian. Okay, moving right along now, uh, I believe Katie Hornbeck and also Jeff Rasmussen both are on the line to do the next agenda item, funding and grants update. Hi hey everyone, uh, good afternoon. Katie Hornbeck, Grants Manager. Um, just quickly can uh, talk about the grant staff report that's in your packet. Um, uh, the one thing I will say is just a couple days after I prepared this report, um, I submitted a grant application to Caltrans, their active transportation program, cycle six. Uh, the application was for the um, Martinez San Francisco Bay Trail project with the Barilessa to Nedged Lee staging area. And that was just shy of $3 million. So you'll see that on the next report, but wanted to highlight it since it, it did come, like get submitted this month. Um, and since we're, we're pretty much at the mid-year, I also just wanted to say that um, by, the, by the end of June, we'll have submitted about 30 grant applications and there will have been about 10 uh, grant awards. And that is my grant staff report update. Happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, Director Waspier, Director Rosario, anything? All right. You're muted, Dave. <laughs> Sorry, Katie, what was the grant for Anthony Chabot? Anthony Chabot, um, it was um, a Coastal Conservancy uh, grant, the um, Wildfire Resilience. So we had submitted oh, right. a, a pre-proposal several months ago, and then we're asked to submit um, a full application um, in May. So that's what that was. It was for the um, biomass facility, uh, pilot, pilot program, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, with some fuels treatment in Anthony Chabot. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I remember now. <laughs> great, thank you very much, Katie. Um, okay, so I guess we, next up, we have our advocate briefings. Uh, Eric, were you gonna introduce us or should we go directly to, uh, to Peter, Peter's on. I think just go, go ahead and go directly to Great. Peter. It's fine. Great, thank you. Hi, Peter. Thank you, Chair Eccles and Director Waspi, Director Rosario. Great to be with you this afternoon. Just wanted to give you a brief update on some key topics. I know we're limited in time today, so I'll keep it brief, but um, please don't hesitate to ask questions. I know that we've talked in the past about the exoneration of the Port Chicago 50. And in that, on that topic, um, I've been in regular contact with Representative DeSalme's office. Give you a brief update on where things stand related to this, what is called an exoneration resolution. He had been successful last year in having that resolution included as part of the House defense reauthorization bill. And it would direct, just direct the Department of Defense and the Secretary of the Navy to um, reflect that the military record should reflect that the exoneration applies to the Port Chicago 50. And that 
um, the Secretary of the Navy should take those, those actions. There is some details I wanna share with you and some of it is on us, some of it's on DOD to resolve. Um, so the House Defense Bill passed in committee this week. It will be brought up in mid-July and considered by, by the House. It's likely that the Senate follows along that same timeline as well. Last year, um, Representative DeSalme was able to get that resolution or that language in on the Port Chicago 50 as, before the bill got to um, the floor in the House. It was then opposed by the Senate and by some DOD officials. And so I took it, you know, I took that assignment and we're working with the Park District, we communicated on behalf of the Park District views to Senator Feinstein and to Senator Padilla. Representative DeSalne met personally with Senator Padilla on his priorities vis-a-vis -vis a set of legislative priorities. He also met with Senator Feinstein personally on his set of priorities. Port Chicago exoneration resolution was at the top of his list or one of his priorities that he shared with both of them on June 13th and June 14th. So I've had some communication with Senator Feinstein's office. They're looking into the matter. They appreciated the letter from the Park District. Um, the question becomes though, Department of Defense says they don't have any records to quote unquote address this matter because a repository that had the records, there was a fire and many records were lost. So it's a question of whether stakeholder groups may have some DOD records that could be shared with the department um, might be able to, because at the end of the day, this is a resolution. The Department of Defense can decide what to do. They cannot do anything or they could take action. I'm hopeful that with the level of communication that is happening, that um, there will be an accelerated um, addressing of this issue. But there still may be a sticking point, which is the Department of Defense needs some records or some documentation in order to do their due diligence. So Congress can take its action, but then DOD could say, we don't have anything, we can't do anything. Um, and so hopefully there may be some records out there that we're not aware of that can help um, answer that issue or address that matter. So um, Park District's focus on both the Visitor Center and the exoneration issue. Um, and so just wanted to give you an update on where things stand there and Representative Salme continues to, to work it behind the scenes and in, in more public fashion because he had a very nice visit there recently. Um, second topic I just wanted to cover is appropriations. And there've been um, some community project funding requests that were submitted by the Park District um, for funding this year. Just to give you a context of then it's be, these community project funding requests have become popular, um, used to be called earmarks. This year, members of, in the house submitted $12 billion in those community project funding requests. Last year, it was $7 billion. So that's an increase, pretty significant increase. Um, question becomes, when does the appropriations bills get resolved? Because it's an election year, most people believe that a continuing funding resolution will have to be passed. Uh, the fiscal year, as you may recall, in the federal government ends on September 30th. So it may be that there needs to be a continuing funding resolution until Congress can resolve those uh, funding matters at the end of the year or the beginning of next year. It tends to be the pattern for, um, of recent years. Democrats um, in the House have moved forward with addressing and moving forward on these separate bills. There's 12 separate funding bills that fund the federal government. And um, this week, they started that process. It will continue next week. There may be some details that um, can be shared next week. Um, sometimes they're shared, sometimes they're not when it comes to community project funding requests. So. I'll be in touch, I'll let you know um, if there's details to be shared. So 
the House is on a very fast track to finish their appropriations work in committee um, by June 30th. And then the question becomes, what, what's the Senate timeline? The Senate timeline is unclear at this point. Um, they tend to move at a different pace than, than the House does. The House is going to probably try and get most of its bills passed by the full House um, by the end of July. So again, I'll keep you updated on that. America the Beautiful is the program that really uh, covers a variety of different issue areas and programs for the Department of the Interior and the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, it tends to focus on spotlighting projects that restore and connect um, and conserve the 30% of lands by 2030. Um, you may have seen the announcement, $270 million to state and local um, assistance was provided um, earlier this month to states. So California um, has received its portion of the LWCF state and local assistance funding. So that process is now um, moving forward. Um, I'll just touch on another bill that we talked about last time, just to share with you. Bipartisan bills are moving forward in the energy environment space. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act passed the House on June 14th by a vote of 231 to 190. It was a diverse coalition started about five years ago. It would provide $1.3 billion per year to states to conserve, restore, and protect wildlife and habitat. So it um, still has some work to do, still has to pass the Senate, um, but it's, uh, it's on par and has a similar coalition to the Land and Water Conservation Fund Coalition that um, we're all very aware of. Lastly, I'll just touch on uh, what the mood of the electorate is and going into less than six months before the, the election coming up. I think you have to think about it from the perspective if you're a national leader or a, a, in Congress or um, in the executive branch, you're dealing with COVID, supply issues, the war in Ukraine, inflation, gas prices, food prices, gun safety, climate change, build back better, reconciliation bill, semiconductor bill, the Affordable Care Act expiration at the end of the year, and these latest Supreme Court decisions. And gas prices um, are an example of an issue that is just a vexing issue for any public official um, for a variety of different reasons. But um, inflation and gas prices happen to be something that is causing a lot of challenges and consternation for a lot of people around the country. But it's also, as a policy official, trying to find solutions when it's sometimes out of their control because it's um, private sector or it's market driven. Um, the Congress is trying to address that in the House and in the Senate, but um, you probably have seen a lot of coverage of this issue. It's, um, it's a gory and not, I think is the best way to, to put it. You may have also seen that the House and Senate just in the last 12 hours passed gun safety legislation, which is pretty pretty significant um, for a variety of different reasons, um, not the least of which is keeping our children safe and our families safe. Um, the Senate vote was 64 to 34, 14 Senate Republicans voted for the bill. The House passed the bill earlier this afternoon, uh, 234 to 193. And so um, it's interesting, it was a compromise, didn't meet everybody's um, desires. Um, but it does show that even though Washington sometimes seems broken, that um, in narrow margins in, in both chambers, that people can come together and reach agreement on something that is pretty fundamental and pretty important to a lot, uh, keeping people safe. So I think you can anticipate, though, people pivot, you know, pivoting back into their corners um, after this bipartisan um, passage of this bill. Um, we talked a 
a little bit of reports about the primary results um, that continue to happen and show a current trend of the House of Representatives um, and Republicans having a better than 50-50 chance of picking up um, more seats to become the majority in the next Congress. So um, there's, again, real attempts by the, by the president and by Democrats to try and address issues that are <clears throat> front and center to people as it relates to infrastructure. And there seems to be <coughs> a, kind of a, I guess the best way to put it is a growing consensus that maybe something within Build Back Better would help the economy at this um, crucial point. A lot of people thought that a Build Back Better or reconciliation bill wasn't possible, um, but there's more and more economists saying there may, may need to be at least something narrower um, that deals with drug prices, deals with um, the ACA Affordable Care Act subsidies that would expire at the end of the year. Um, deals with clean energy taxes, that um, that could be significant and that could be helpful. Um, so I think I will stop there in the spirit of time and answer any questions people have. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, Director Waspier, Director Rosario, did you have any um, questions, comments? I just want to say uh, it's good news to hear that the Land and Water Conservation Fund got money got dispersed to the states. Do you know what the share was to California? Almost 24 million. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Great. for your advocacy in DC. Yeah. To 23.646 million. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything else? Uh, Director Rossby, did you have anything? No. Oh, no. Okay. Sorry. You shook your head already. I, I see Eric's hand up. I'm going to just, I have a question and then I'll let Eric um, speak. But uh, so Peter, I, I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm, I'm astounded, frankly, that the Department of Defense is saying that they don't have the records to exonerate these men. And um, so do we have any idea like what records are they are missing? Because, you know, if these these men were charged with mutiny in court. And so uh, there are plenty of court records, I'm, I'm sh I, I would hope. Right. I mean, yeah, I, just, I would hope so, too. And again, I, I think it's a homework assignment, not for us. But, you know, yeah. if we've got to provide some documentation because we have it. Maybe that'll help. But th that was the excuse used at last year's. Um, con conference what DOD told literally the House and the Senate. That's the way it was reported to me. Seems a little confusing um, or somebody's confused. Um, I agree with you, Chair Eccles, that there has to be some file or some record somewhere. Um, but I was also told that there was a devastating fire that where there was lots of, in a repository where lots of records were lost, but that's not to say there isn't another set of records somewhere else because there has to be a report about this um so yeah yeah right. i mean i i believe that there could have been a fire that wiped out the dod's records but it, it seems to me that you would at least it would at least be court records available somewhere and i know this is not not your this is i'm not asking you to go dig them out but but yes i agree someone's someone's got to find them because that is just that's frankly shocking to me so um yeah, I hope I hope other advocates and people are able to pull out those court records and push this forward. Uh, Dennis, uh, Director Rossby. I think that's a great question, Elizabeth. So, but was it a, a civil court trial or was it a court martial done by the Navy? Mm, good question. Convicted of mutiny. I, I believe it was a court trial by the Navy. Oh, okay. So that would, that could be the problem. But still, I mean, still, you think at this point, given what we know about history, they could, they, they have to know who the 50 people are. So you could give them the benefit of the doubt at this point, seems to me. 
that that in director Eccles, that was going to be my question so when i raise my hand but but now that we've kind of moved past it i i um i wonder about the naacp because if if thoroughgood marshall was monitoring that case i'm sure he was wise enough to get copies of the information so that might be a good place to start well, right. And he would also have information in defense of these men, which which at this point is probably even more important than than the charges, quite frankly. So so um, so, yeah, yeah. Hopefully that that information is available or some allowances can be made to to exonerate these people. OK, so um, moving on. So I guess that's it for for Peter. Um, thank you very much for the report, for joining us. I know it's a difficult time in Washington. We appreciate your ongoing advocacy and perseverance. Um, and now we'll turn over to our state advocate, Doug Houston. Hi, good afternoon, Director Eccles and other directors, Doug Houston, state legislative advocate with the district. So. Um, let me give you a snapshot of where we're at the legislative cycle. We are about 80% through the second year of the two-year biennial legislative cycle here. Um, next week is the final week that bills can be heard in policy committee hearings. And then they get referred to appropriations. And then once they're referred to appropriations, all these bills, and there will be a lot of them, they're held on suspense and they'll be in a stall pattern through July because the legislature is going to be on recess beginning July 1. And then midway through August, uh, they will take up those bills on suspense. And I know that we have a, a host of bills that we're supporting in both houses. So we'll be monitoring those closely. Hence, there's the, the activities around policy and policy matters are sort of at a breakneck, the frenzy pace over there. Um, all the while, we have this little thing in the backdrop called the budget. And um, you might recall that back on June 13th, uh, both houses approved a spending plan, both the Senate and the Assembly approved a, a plan. Um, if you remember last year and years past, the legislature, um, in order to not get their pay docked, needs to approve what appears to be a balanced budget by June 15th. So that plan that was approved um, was representative of a very high level document that reflects legislative priorities. It was incomplete. It didn't have uh, administration buy-in. So um, where we're at right now is, and we're really close to a final agreement from what I'm gathering. Some of the remaining issues that are a bit contentious are the manner and level of tax relief. You've probably heard that the, the administration is looking for uh, upwards of $800 per household per vehicle, well, 400 per vehicle in the form of tax relief. Um, and then the legislature is taking a little bit more targeted, narrowed approach and wants to redirect $200 per person with dependents as well. Um, for households, um, couples $250,000 or less and then single $125,000. And I heard of all the issues, the rift is probably the largest in this area. And, and I don't know if they'll come in to agreement um, prior to the, the July deadline, but I, they're, get, they're, they're getting inching closer from what I understand. Another big issue is one-time expenditures versus ongoing expenditures. The administration is getting very, very, and finance, very anxious about revenue projections moving forward. Just this last month, we've seen the first downtick in our revenues, probably in the last 18 months, they went down 4%. So the notion of ongoing funding commitments for for programs around health and human services, education, um, there's some significant pushback in that area. High-speed rail, um, I don't know if you're following this at all. High-speed rail authority um, is looking to access the remaining Prop 1A funds, the $4 billion, so that they ex can expedite the completion of the 
the valley segment of high speed rail. The legislature wants to put some parameters on how they're spending their money. They really want them to spend the money exclusively on getting that segment completed so that we have a project that we can demonstrate to the feds and others that can be a viable project. They want, the legislature wants them to spend, again, the money there and not make investments outside of the Central Valley. So that's, that's kind of the sticking point there. And I think why that's important to note is that the entire transit transportation package, including what's pre and proposed for active transportation, which is an additional billion dollars, is really tethered to the outcome of high-speed rail. I just heard that they probably have an agreement. So back to Katie's presentation on active transportation and the grant, um, good timing. Um, I think there may be a, a little better, they, we might have a better shot at trying to access some of these funds through this um, enhanced uh, revenues that are gonna be available through active transportation. Uh, another area, one-time investments in climate. Um, the governor's May revise was pretty quiet on this front. The Senate put out a pretty ambitious package around funding climate and wildfire. And um, I think they were making significant headway, got agreements with the assembly. But more recently, and Elizabeth, maybe you know about this, I know the administration decided that they want to spend some of the money in sort of the resources area on making our grid a little bit more reliable. Um, energy source is a little bit more sustainable going forward because the demand on the grid, um, particularly in the summer months, is going to be considerable and we're trying to avoid some brownouts. So that will probably draw down some of the funds that might have otherwise been available for climate and wildfire. So negotiations are um, to reconcile everything sort of around going 24-7 around the clock. Uh, trailer bill language and budget bill junior language is there. I know they're under development in that area as well. And that, that's a language that will implement parts of the budget. Um, items such as members requests, as you may recall, we've had those meetings with our legislators asking for district specific projects. It's my understanding that they came to agreement around a package of 2.5 to $3 billion that would be available to both houses for specific requests that are made by uh, folks like East Bay, Bay Regional Park District. So, um, I, and I should note parenthetically, and it's worth noting because on Eric and Lisa and uh, Eric's team working with the advocates within the Bay Area in particular, really strong advocacy group down there, were very, very helpful and helped to spearhead and appropriation in the budget, SB 154, uh, for $35 million for recreational trails. This is the single largest investment in recreation trails in the history of California. And if it sticks, because I don't know if the administration is going to sign off or not, again, it would be a tremendous uh, boon for trails advocates in the state of California. So on the budget front, what's been an added complication to putting together a timely spending plan has been um, the recent potential change in assembly leadership. I'm sure that you all caught wind of this. Uh, earlier in the month, assembly member Rebus, Robert Rebus out of Salinas, uh, approached our current speaker and disclosed that he had 37 votes out of the Assembly Democratic Caucus uh, to become speaker. I, I don't know if you folks are good mathematicians, and obviously he wasn't the best of mathematicians because in order to secure speakership, you need 40 plus votes. And uh, nothing transpired. He, I think it was he was approached on, he being the speaker, current speaker was approached on a Friday. He had the entire weekend to rally the troops. And by the time they reconvened the following week, um, he, he remained a speaker. Um, but there is, there's quite infighting that is taking place right now. A lot of speculations, scenarios like, well, they're gonna take a vote on a new speaker 
when they resume session in August. And then others are saying, well, that's, that's ridiculous. We need leadership continuity going into November elections. So it's anybody's guess right now. I think the speaker feels as though his hold is, is obviously more tenuous than it has been in the past. So he'll be looking over his shoulder going forward. But I think an interesting outcome that's worth noting, and, and I, don't, I don't know how this plays itself out, but our entire delegation, the East Bay Regional Park District's delegation, with the exception of Alex Lee, um, we're backing Robert Rebus as speaker. So um, again, I don't know what the repercussions, if there are gonna be any repercussions associated with this, if there's gonna be punishment handed out. I do know, and there, I won't name names, but there are two of our delegation actually were leading the charge in the ousting of a speaker. Um, so I think that's going to create some friction and I'm, I'm just hoping it doesn't spill over into some of the budget activities. I'm, I'm hearing it's not going to, but, you know, I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that it does not. So that's it. Any, any questions on any of that? Director Waspy, Director Rosario, anything? Uh, yeah, thanks for the report, Doug. It sounds exciting up there, but I guess I had one question. So on, on some of the legislation that we supported and watched and, and didn't want, one of the watch ones that was vetoed was Glazer's bill about the Forestry Corps program for formerly incarcerated individuals. I, I thought that was a great program. What? what how, how, yeah, how he's, uh, we were going to get some of the legislation, Dennis, my understanding, but I, um, on that I believe, and Eric and Lisa, you can help me with this one. He's reintroduced it. And the reason it was vetoed last, and this was actually last year. So he's reintroduced the bill this year, from what I recall. The reason it was vetoed last year is that it didn't manage to secure any funding in the budget. It was probably about a $25 million ask. And I do believe that he did, in fact, ask for the funds. But that's a pretty sizable amount for one legislator. So I don't think it had anything to do with the, the policy merits of the bill. It was more... How are we going to fund this? Thanks. Director Rosario. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Doug. Um, on the, um, the member, member request, can you clarify? Uh, you said two to three, was that million or billion? No, that did I, if I said million, that, you know, it was billion, 2.5 oh, okay. to $3 billion. Wow. To be divided between the houses. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah, a lot of money. And then um, I think Alex Lee had a, a bill to um, uh, figure out how to get around uh, the prevailing wage. Yeah, is, is it is that still alive? 20, 2463, the exemption from prevailing wage requirements primarily around uh, natural resources rated, related work, it, it's due to expire um, next year. Hmm. So it's an extension through, I believe, 2031, my recollection. And it's, it's faring very well, yeah. Um, oh, they, the advocates did a really nice job working with labor early on to head off any concerns. And I suspect it'll, be, um, it'll get signed this year. Great, that's good news. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Doug, for your report. A lot, lot going on up there. We appreciate your advocacy. I see that Eric has his hand up. So, Eric, you want to go ahead? Yeah, no, I just wanted to acknowledge um, Doug's hard work on the recreational trail piece, that, that funding um, a few years ago. Congress essentially uh, eliminated the separate uh, amount of money for recreational trails or, or put it put it in with a, a, a combination of active transportation money. Um, and it, it, it's never really filtered down for, for recreational purposes like it used to. Um, so to see that in the in the budget is a real is a real win. So um, thank, thank you, Doug, for your work on that. And um, also just uh, keeping our fingers crossed on the other member asks that we've made and 
really appreciate um, Lisa's work on that as well as as well mm -hmm. as Doug's. Um, so hopefully we'll have some good news between now and maybe maybe even between now and yeah. when we go to Sacramento on Tuesday. Yeah, I failed to mention. So I, I think they're going to try to wrap everything up, maybe in the legislature and wrap everything up um, later this afternoon. Should have a budget bill or a budget bill junior, and I don't want to get into technical terms, uh, available for and daylighted for public review by Monday afternoon. So. Cool. Great, thank you. All right. Well, I think we're, unless there's something further, we can move on to our legislative program updates, new legislation. Okay. Um, first one should be pretty quick. It's uh, simply to make July Parks Make Life Better Month. If we uh, we act now, we can we can actually recognize it as as July first, <laughs> so, which would be great. Um, the second bill is a reintroduction of a bill that um, I believe uh, Representative Mullen introduced uh, last year. Uh, he's running for Congress, so um, Assemblymember Ward uh, introduced this. And it's, it's essentially it calls for regional adaptation action plans uh, to be organized. And, and I, I think this could be very helpful to the district. As we know, we've been talking about all of our shoreline properties that are protecting communities inland uh, on our dime for the most part, um, particularly like the Halo Ridge shoreline and um, you know the Alameda, Crown Beach. Uh, so having more of a regional approach to these issues, um, I think would be important. And we need to make sure that as these uh, entities come together that there's money attached um so um Doug, maybe we can talk offline about that to make sure that <laughs> that funding is included as part of the uh regional plan there, uh, there is there is funding in the budget good um the eddie garcia bill on playground disability access would um make sure that any future grants for playground equipment uh, include, you know, ensure that they're ADA accessible. Um, and as is as noted in the um, in the memo here that we have 14 playgrounds and one that has um, accessible play elements. Uh, eight, eight of them are accessible, but we only have one that has the um, uh, play elements that are accessible. And Eric, if I can interject on that one, this bill is really thoughtfully written and it's not just about uh, physical accessibility, but it also is asking for play structures that have features uh, that are welcoming for children with autism um, and mm -hmm. other um, other needs for the playground. So enclosed spaces or, or other interactive elements. Thanks for thanks for bringing that in. Lisa. Um, and then. Uh, our Kahan's effort to uh, have act community access agreements with state park interpretive and visitor services, uh, I think actually would potentially impact us at Del Val and um, Crown Beach, it, uh, which, which is a, it's a good thing. Um, it uh, has, uh, allows a nonprofit to partner with a unit of the state park system um, to, to uh, have an underserved communities have access to uh, the services that our recreation and interpretive centers provide. Uh, then moving on to federal legislation, uh, we have, uh, the first one is kind of an interesting um, effort, uh, and I'm not sure what, if Peter uh, would have some, um, some input on it, but it, instead of actually amending the Staff Word Act by itself, it well, I, I, it authorizes the president, I, I guess, to provide FEMA funding when a disaster uh, induces mud, mudslides and other other elements um, post wildfire. And that actually has occurred um, in, in some of our properties. And so um, this would be a, a positive thing. It would make some of that damage, uh, you know, uh, funded by, be able to be funded by FEMA. Uh, Revitalizing cities through parks. 
is essentially another effort at uh, what used to be called UPAR, but it's an urban park program that would allow communities to take uh, vacant lots um, and develop them into municipalities and it, and it provides some funding to do that or authorizes funding to do that. So those are our bills to support. Um, I think, it, I think Yuli, at this point, we would be asking for a vote before we move on. Well, I would recommend that anyway. I think that that would make sense. So first of all, let's ask if there are any questions or comments from the other board members, Director Waspi or Director Rosario, um, any questions for, for Lisa or Eric? No. No. Yeah, these bills sound sound really good. <laughs> so I, I don't have any uh, any questions. D, you're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I mean, my only comment is that you know, with the amount of playgrounds that we have, why why um, why do we only have just one that's fully accessible? So uh, it's it's a district something a question for the district. And us as board members, why do we just have this? Just the one. Perhaps you could ask that question when it comes to the full board. Yeah. I'll just note on the, the Padilla bill that deals with the Stafford Act. It's a 75-25 cost share. And um, so, and it is again, providing funding for wildfire, wildfire mitigation assistance. <laughs> This is a challenging issue right now because there's, you know, obviously a drought happening. And so um, some other elected officials want to see the Stafford Act um, provide funding for drought assistance as well. Um, we're dealing with climate change. Um, you know, FEMA needs to get into the 21st century here. Wildfires and drought are front and center. And, um, but, the question is, where's the money going to come from if these, you know, these elements, these wildfire and drought become uh, part of the part of the Stafford Act? Um, people like to guard the Stafford Act. Um, I hope it gets some traction. Um, it's going to take the collective West and members in the House and in the Senate to make this. Um, move it to passage. So I'll just stop there. Great, thank you, Peter, for those insights. Very helpful. Um, okay, well, at this point, I, I will entertain a, a motion to support all of these bills. Sarah? So moved. Second. Okay, um, Yuli, would you, or Madam Secretary, would you like to call the roll? Either one is fine, um, yes. Uh, we'll start with uh, Director Waspy. Aye. Director Rosario. Aye. And Chair Eccles. Aye. Motion so moved. Great. Excellent. So um, we can move on to the ones. Well, I see that there are none that were are recommended as opposing, and no new ones, I should say, that are recommended as opposed. And, and then, um, Eric, would you like to? address the watch. Yeah, I just wanted to make um, the board aware that um, Senator Glazer is pursuing uh, legislation on, on open fires, uh, fire fire pits and state parks. Um, it, it, it's seeking to, to, you know, essentially make sure that the top, the, the, uh, the most um, uh, preventative and cautious uh, uh, approaches are taken. And we already do that at DelVal, um, and we already have signage to, to indicate that uh, and to make sure that our fires are completely put out. Uh, so in the one state park that where this would be an issue, I think we're, we're covered and, and we've made our, our um, fire team aware of this legislation, but we wanted to just let you all know that that was moving through, especially since it's a member from, our, from the East Bay delegation. Then um, the second one is uh, really just basically calling for half price admissions on admissions day. Uh, this could also apply to DelVal and to, um, to uh, Crown Beach where parking fees are, are sometimes collected. Uh, I don't think it would have any impact on East Shore, but just wanted to make sure folks 
we're aware of those two bills because they could impact the couple of the state parks we manage. Great, thank you, Eric. Um, okay, then moving right along. Oh, unless, sorry, uh, Director Waspy, you had a question. Yeah, yeah, and, and I get to use, I've never used this term before, I, I get to use it now. Eric, do you think this is a slippery slope? Because as I read this, a state agency can tell us only in state parks, I understand that, which are the three that we run, could tell us how to admit, how to how we run our fire um, awareness. Uh, I remember a city down south of here, I'm sure Kelly might have a comment on it, when uh, the city of Fremont decided they were going to close down our park because of a fire danger. And they are, they have their own fire agency. Uh, and this says, well, you know, um, they can do equal or greater to the local, they refer to the local fire departments or fire protection districts. I'm wondering if this, uh, letting someone else tell us how to run our fire um, uh, awareness programs or prevention programs might uh, trickle down to some uh, cities that might want to tell us how to open our parks, close our parks, run our parks during uh, quote fire season. Well, cities or fire protection districts, right? Um, that's a good question, um, Director Waspy, and maybe Doug, we can talk offline about maybe checking with the author to understand the intent of the, the bill. Um, my, my assumption is it has to do with uh, Mount Diablo, but uh, I don't, I haven't had that conversation. And Eric, I would also uh, suggest um, we confirm if the park district's fire department is considered the local jurisdiction for our parks, um, in which case that would be, that'd be helpful. Yeah, well, we're having that discussion now with uh, Moraga and San Ramon. So, because <laughs> a lot of uh, their jurisdiction overlaps into ours. So we're having some, we're having those discussions now and uh, hopefully we'll come to uh, an agreement somehow. Yeah, but it's all the more reason why to watch watch the bill and, and maybe make sure yeah. that, you know, if there's a tweak that needs to be made in the language, maybe maybe we can. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Okay. So now we'll move on to um, the projects and programs here for Lisa. Well, the first one I think I'll let Lisa speak to uh, on our best value contracting legislation. Uh, so the legislation continues to move forward uh, productively. And so in terms of the next steps, we have an upcoming uh, Senate, I believe it's finance and government, but I'm gonna confirm right now. Yeah, so Senate governance and finance uh, committee is happening next Wednesday. And so we will be attending to confirm or provide testimony if needed or, or acknowledge that we do sponsor and support the bill. I don't believe we've had strong opposition. So we're excited to see that uh, hopefully be successful this year. Doug, do you have anything to add? Okay. Um, moving on to the next item, uh, we did wanna include, as Doug mentioned, we're on part two of the two year legislative session um, and we are approaching the end. So we wanted to reflect back and let the board legislative committee know where all the different bills that have come before you are. And so included in your packet is an overview. And we're looking at this from two different lenses, one being what are the status of the bill, which you can find in the table. And then in the report, we also have an overview of how the different bills align uh, with the legislative program areas that you all supported at the beginning of this year. Um, so as you can see, it's pretty well balanced across the board with, of course, wildfire resilience, we have a few more bills that we're supporting on uh, than other areas, but sea level rise, preparedness, community health, ecosystem services, green jobs, welcoming visitor use facilities, and climate-friendly transportation have all had legislation move forward at both the state and federal level that the Park District has supported. Much of the federal legislation is, is still considered uh, introduced and is in discussion to move into those larger packages that Peter referenced. Um, and then in terms of the state funding, we've had 17 uh, pieces of legislation that we supported. They were chaptered last year. We have 17 that have either died or stalled out in committee. And then we have 31 that are still alive and active um, moving through the process. And so we'll be reporting back at the end of the legislative session what the overall uh, year in review looks like. 
Uh, but just wanted to give that quick update of where things are right now. Um, and if Eric and Doug or Peter have any comments on the legislation, I welcome that or happy to answer any questions from the board. Well, I just I, I want to compliment you, Lisa, on the on the uh, visual. <laughs> the pie chart is really is really great. And um, I think from a from a, a management standpoint, it's helpful to know where we're investing our time and if it's aligning with our our stated uh, mission and goals. So uh, it's great to see this in, in quantified. Um, it also speaks to the amount of bills we um, are tracking and, and, and actually research. And I know sometimes um, legislation, particularly at the federal level, um, doesn't advance as a standalone bill and often, often things get blended together. And, and so one might wonder, do we need to take positions on 100 bills? Um, and I, I, I guess the short answer to that is probably not, but the, the other answer to it is um, from a staffing standpoint, we are monitoring and tracking and seeing trends and, and, and doing the research to know what's, what's in the legislation. And so it's beneficial um, in providing knowledge as we, as we put these bills on to the committee's agenda. So just wanna to, want to know that if there's, there's a value in it, even if some of the bills don't, don't go forward. Um, and I also wanted to just say that, that uh, as we uh, evolve with our department, I think we'll be more and more engaged in prioritizing uh, really uh, more co-sponsoring co of bills. We, we, we did that in a couple of bills this year. And I think given the, the abilities of our agency and our, our government affairs team, um, that we'll be uh, looking to do more of that in the future. Great, thank you. So uh, Director Waspy or Director Rosario, any comments, questions? Well, I, I, I too like to see this quantified like this and, and I think it's great. And I'm, it's just a testament to the hard work you guys do and the hard work our advocates do. And, and, and I truly appreciate it. And I think we separate ourselves from most agencies uh, by going way, way, uh, way, way beyond anybody else doing, and I'm, I'm really happy we're doing this. Yeah, ditto. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it, it is really important, and, and I appreciate you putting the time in, into preparing this in addition to everything else that you all are doing, but I, I think it is important to see, you know, where we've been and where we're headed and and to have some sense of, of of all of it and and it, it's very uh, I find it very helpful as well so thank you for the extra data okay so um let's see are we ready to go to the site visits then um well just a, a word on um ecologically sensitive vegetation management um that was a bill that we did co-sponsor, a good, good segue. Uh, it did not advance, um, but we will be speaking to it on Tuesday, whether we get the $8 million for our pilot or not. But I, but I wanted to, to, to take a minute just to explain it within the context of our overall fire uh, department and fire work and stewardship department and their work. Um, we are truly, truly are leading the way in, in this work. And every, every little thing from, and I should have complimented planning too, because every little thing like um, Drake's work in, in the planning department for the uh, fire risk reduction community um, list that we are now eligible for, to uh, working with Cal Recycle to ensure that some of our $10 million could be used for a carbonator, uh, which you all saw the, the, the conversation about that on Tuesday. Um, really cutting edge uh, way of disposing of, of waste. And, and we had to negotiate that with, with Cal Recycle, surprisingly. Um, and then also, you know, ecologically sensitive vegetation. Once we remove the dead and dying trees, uh, our stewardship team is prepared to go in and essentially reforest with more fire and drought tolerant species. Um, and, and if we do it all at once, it actually saves money. So really just a for such such forward thinking work, and um, I think sometimes we we uh, don't 
applaud ourselves enough for, for all the uh, forward thinking work we do in the fire space. And, and I know Dennis uh, and Dee, you both were on the front lines in 1991 and it's led to this agency really being um, a leader in this work. And I, I hope we get that history and that story out, out more in, in public because um, because it's a good one to be told. And we're, we, we're going to be documenting the work as we move forward um, to make sure that other agencies can learn from our successes and even some of the challenges we're going to face. So just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge that. Great. Thank you, Eric. Okay. So unless the other board members have any comments, I'm going to move on to the site visits. All right. Seeing none, why don't you go ahead with that? And I'll, I'll take it, but uh, Yuli, if you have any comments on this, I know you were at the site visit as well. It was truly a, um, a gathering. Um, it was Representative Nisalne who, um, uh, you know, has, has fought so many courageous battles with his health, uh, but he was there for the first time south of Bailey Road with the vista that I think you all have seen on your, on your board um, site visit. And uh, Director Lane and Director Coffey were both there, and it was really a extended conversation about the history of both acquiring the property and turning it into a park, and then um, obviously the, the the history of um, Port Chicago 50 and the uh, the uh, entire Port Chicago event and what it led to. And I and I think on exoneration he was motivated to to try to raise uh the profile he, you know he's obviously got the resolution but um you know we need a little bit more public uh acknowledgement and recognition of the history and he had at, the, at that time offered to potentially do an op-ed um and then he also was encouraging us to to reach out to senator P padilla which we did um and he I, and i think peter reported on this earlier he was going to meet with senator padilla himself which i, I believe has happened too so just a generally a, a really great um, day reminiscing and, and then also making future plans for, for what can happen out there and also for, for exoneration. I don't know, Yuli, did, I, did you have some different impressions as, as well? Um, no, I, I agree with Eric. It was a beautiful day. So it was perfect, uh, perfect opportunity uh, to take both uh, President Coffey and uh, Director Lane um, out for the visit with, um, with Representative Desanye. I just thought to myself, like how rewarding that must feel um, to at least have some sort of recognition within the naming after all of his years of work. Um, and um, yeah, a lot of, I, I think I agree with most of uh, and every uh, what Eric is saying. And as far as my one thing I would like to share, um, since I have this opportunity, is that I do see um, that this is an opportunity for restitution. And uh, it is important uh, that we don't confuse that for reparations. Uh, I think it's important for us all to remember that, you know, these men, you know, serve their country. So anyway, I, I thought that was an opportunity uh, to kind of say that. But yeah, no, wonderful, perfectly said, Eric. Nothing more to add. <laughs> yeah, so I think that that's the summary, and uh, we were we were planning to comment on a bill quirk walk and talk, but uh, it's been postponed. So that was the only site visit that we had um, since we last met. Um, I think we'll be doing some more over the summer, though. So stay tuned. We are we are planning a site visit at South of Bailey Road for the other legislative offices, uh, their staff, particularly Senator Padilla. So uh, we'll keep you posted when that when that occurs. Great. Well, that's great. I'm glad it went well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric and, and Yuli. I'm glad you were able to attend and, and um, I appreciate your comments as well. Um, okay. Well, uh, directors, do you have anything or if we can just move on to, well, if it, Oh, yes, Director Rossi. <laughs> nothing, nothing uh, really serious, but I sure would have liked to have been invited. I, I'm very proud of uh, the um, Thurgood Marshall Park also. Uh, and I know we get ward centric occasionally, but on something as big as that, I, I hope we can be invited to some of those things also. 
Yes, I, I, yes, I ditto. <laughs> I share your feelings, Director Wasby. Yeah, I'll put it. I'll put it on my list. <laughs> okay. And, and I guess it, we should we should put it on the list and, and and make sure we're reaching out to everyone. If if we do get a quorum, we'll have to we'll have to post it. But I don't think there's a a problem with that. Yeah. I think there was there were some uh, regulations as far as spacing and things like that, but we'll definitely be very thoughtful in, in how we proceed. So appreciate uh, Director Waspy's comments. So is there a ruling or is there a thought that, um, oh, this was a fact finding deal. This wasn't a celebration, right? So it was, what was this? Uh, he just visited, right? It, it, it was intended to be a, um, a conversation about uh, both funding for the visitor center and um, and exoneration, and we did ha have those conversations there, okay. and uh, yeah, yeah, and just an opportunity for to get him to get on site. But I see Peter popped up. So, Representative Basame has a policy of no more than five individuals when he's meeting with folks. I think it's due to COVID protocols and an office role that he just tends to have. And so I don't think there was any any other intent than they're trying to maintain that policy in Washington and when he's meeting with folks um, due to health and COVID rules that they have as an office policy. Yeah, thanks for that, Peter. That that is true that he had a, a, a restriction of five, and and so it was essentially me, Yuli, and Brian um, to to tell the planning story there, and um, and then the two board members. Okay. Understandable. Okay. Well, thanks very much um, for explaining that. That's that is helpful to know. But I think. Um, Director Waspy's point is still well taken in other situations. So there might be other situations where it could be noticed and more board members can come. But this is this is a um, you know it's a, certainly an on a conversation we can have um, offline. Um, okay, so anything under other matters? No, I don't think so. Unless, okay, I don't know if there's anything else that we forgot. Well, great. So then we will um, move on to public comment. If there's any further public comment. I'm not seeing anybody with their hands up, Yuli. No? Okay. No, I haven't received anything. Um, so if, if we don't hear from anyone now, then I guess we'll consider it. <laughs> Close. Okay, perfect. Perfect. And um, well, thank you, uh, Government Affairs team, for your articles and social media. I really appreciate having all that information and appreciate that you're sending all that electronically. <laughs> it's uh, very helpful. Um, and I think that brings us to board comments. So, Director Waspy or Director Rosario, did you have anything you wanted to say further? I guess I would just say thank you very much. It's always informative. I always appreciate this, these meetings. Um, and I guess I would like to say, and I guess I don't know that this is the forum, but it's. I think we should say it at every forum. The Park District had two um, wildfires, uh, either on its property or adjacent to its property that threatened its property and homes around its property. Uh, and we do what we do. We, we had a mutual aid responses. Every agency came together and put the things out. They're out. We were successful and, and we continue to be successful in not only doing pre-fire mitigation, but when they do happen and they will happen, we, we put them out. Yeah, and to, to add to that, sometimes we're able to put them out quickly because we've done the mitigation ahead of time. Definitely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Director Rossby, for that. It's important. Um, Director Rosario? Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for their for their uh, reports. And I really appreciate uh, uh, Doug and Peter's uh, insights into what's happening in the state and, and in, in the nation. Um, it kind of helps give us a flavor of, of what's going on, uh, not with just us, but with, with uh, what's happening in, in the country and our state. Uh, it's quite valuable, quite valuable insights, and I appreciate it. 
And of course, appreciate that the work our staff is doing, and and um, I look forward to our our uh, our little our little talks in uh, in Sacramento. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very much to, to our advocates and to our government affairs team and everybody else who joined us today and gave reports and comments. Really appreciate all your hard work. Um, um, sorry, I won't be able to join you next week in Sacramento. I'll be up, up in the mountains. So I <laughs> just planned many months ago. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, I know you, it'll be a good trip and and we'll be seeing you in the future. So, um, and I think with that, we can adjourn. <laughs>